and welcome everybody to this uh, webinar entitled Quo Vadis. And for those who haven't had a classical education, as some of us have, it means where are we going, which I thought would be an interesting question to ask. Um, the plan is to address the future for the UK economy post-COVID, post-Brexit, as we aspire to create a new, bilat new bilateral trade deals and look at the implications for our relationship with America and Asia. And to discuss these issues, we are extremely fortunate, as Doug has said, to, to have a remarkable panel of economists. First, let me introduce Bridget Rosewell. She is an experienced director, policymaker, and economist. She has a track record in advising public and private sector clients on key strategic issues. She's worked extensively on cities, infrastructure, and finance, and advised on projects in road and rail on major property developments and regeneration. She was the chief economist and chief economic advisor to the Greater London Authority between 2002 and 2012, and has previously founded and developed three successful consultancies. Jerry Lyons, as former economic advisor to the Mayor of London and to the Board of Standard Chartered Bank, Jerry is an expert on the world economy, global financial markets, and on economic and regulatory policy with immense expertise on international banking and investment. He's a widely cited economic forecaster, and during his time at DKB in the 1990s, he became known as an accurate forecaster of the Japanese economy, and at Standard Chartered was, I'm told, viewed as one of the global experts on emerging markets. He is now a non-executive director at the Bank of China. And Jerry learned much of what he knows from our final panelist, uh, Patrick Minford, Patrick is a well-known British macroeconomist who is Professor of Applied Economics at Cardiff Business School. In 1976, he was appointed Edward Garner Professor of Applied Economics at the University of Liverpool. And since 1997, he's been Professor of Applied Economics at Cardiff Business School in Cardiff University. In 2016, Patrick was a notable member of the Economists for Brexit group, which advocated the UK leaving the European Union. He's the author of books and articles on exchange rates, unemployment, housing, and macroeconomics, and is director of the Liverpool Research Group in Macroeconomics, which publishes forecasts of all major economies uh, monthly, together with policy and investment advice. And he, like me later, was educated at the same place as our current Chancellor of the Exchequer, so he will know what's going inside the mind of the man at number 11 Downing Street. So ladies and gentlemen, without more ado, I would like to ask Patrick to start us off. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rod. Oh, thank you very much for those kind words. And it's really delightful to, to be sharing the platform with, with you and with Bridget and with Jerry. Um, yes, poor Jerry, he, he suffered at my hands at Liverpool and he's, he's made enormous progress since, <laughs> I'm glad to say. <laughs> So there we are. Uh, I, I thought I'd say a few words, first of all, about Brexit, where we're going, and then a bit about forecasting and the, and the virus, where we've done some modeling. And finally, the very important issue of, of the public finances and Rishi Sunak's problems, which um, obviously are, are, are very much center stage. And so, so I want to end by talking about that and hopefully I'll be quite brief. First of all, Brexit. There are some key points here. First of all, there are, there are big gains to, to us from Brexit, which have, have become, unfortunately, controversial because a lot of economists are against Brexit. And so they've really forgotten their free trade theory and um, have, have also forgotten the importance of free markets and regulative freedom to set an environment so that entrepreneurship can flourish, which is something we, we created under Mrs. Thatcher in the, in the UK economy. It's become quite tarnished by the mass of EU uh, restrictions since then. And so those all, the, 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 the movement of free trade, um, which I think will, as I'll argue in a moment, is combined with free trade with Europe. But there's a lot of nonsense being talked about all that, but it's absolutely the interests of the EU to do a free trade deal with us. And we can manage without it, but we want to be good neighbors. So we would like an, an agreement. I think there will be one. 
So all those things, free trade and, and control of our own regulations, control of our migration to get skilled workers giving, being, being given priority, and of course the saving in our budget will give us gains to, from Brexit over the next um, decade and a half, about 7% of GDP. So that's a meaningful addition to the growth rate. Um, and then, you know, the, the whole pushback from the, the Remain lobby has been that we're, we're going to lose out because of barriers between us and the EU. But I think this is nonsense on various fr fronts. First of all, we will have a trade, a trade deal with the EU. And secondly, non-tariff barriers between us and the EU are actually illegal under WTO rules. So they can be ruled out. But more fundamentally, the, the big problem with the Remain argument is they just don't have the right model of international trade. Um, they have this, uh, this gravity model, which, um, it, which, which is rejected by the UK trade facts. As I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show you a, a diagram in a minute of just how badly it's rejected. Um, and under the, the, the correct model, we gain from free trade um, and prices here fall because of competition internationally being permitted once again, once we get rid of these EU trade barriers that have been erected by the EU around our market through the customs union. Once we get rid of those, prices here will fall to world prices. There'll be more competition. Productivity will rise. And uh, if, if we go to WTO rules, this will cost the EU and not us because, because they will have to absorb these tariffs because they'll have to price their goods in our markets at world prices that will now rule through, through our accession of free trade. Um, whereas we, frankly, can, it doesn't really matter to us that they charge us tariffs because we can sell anywhere we like at, at world prices and they will have to absorb any tariffs they charge on, on, our, on our exports to them. Um, so basically, they will suffer under no deal. We are, in fact, technically better off under no deal than, under, than, than certainly better off under no deal. with them, to be quite honest, because if they, um, if we have tariffs on EU-UK trade, the, the Treasury gets quite a lot of ta tariff revenue. Um, and that would, would actually technically give us a gain. But we really want a, a deal and we certainly don't want delay. If we were to delay, there's, apart from not getting free trade agreements off the ground, which is obviously serious from our point of view with the rest of the world, um, because they will, they'll be browned off if we can't actually sign these deals for, 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 for quite a long time. Uh, there's also the problem, which is really the clincher, that we get embroiled in the Eurozone's own COVID bailout crisis, which we've seen them arguing about over the last um, you know, week or so. And we don't really want to be involved in that and on the hook for contributions to those problems. So we, we really need to um, either, uh, no delay, have a deal, and uh, very likely that the EU, because no deal is very bad for them, will, will sign a deal. And indeed, we're seeing in, in current commentary on the state of the negotiations that, um, that there is likely to be a deal now. Both sides are kind of explaining that they're quite close. That was in today's times. So that's the situation. And this is just a chart showing, um, if, you, if you look at these diagrams, there are various trade facts which you can see for the UK in thick print in all these charts. Uh, these are various things, the trade share with the EU, the trade share with NAFTA, the trade share with the rest of the world, the output ratio, manufacturing versus services, skilled to unskilled wages, um, you know, skilled to unskilled labor ratio. Um, and the, the two lines, the two other lines, the kind of lightly dotted line is what the the gravity model says will happen uh, as a result of simulated behavior. What, what we do is we simulate the behavior over the past of the model uh, a, a lot of times to create a lot of histories. And 
this, these lines show the average of those histories. And you can see it's way off the actual history, which is the thick black line, say for the trade share of the EU or the trade share with NAFTA, same story. This is the gravity model. Um, and the trade share with the rest of the world, again, way off. And if you look at unskilled to, fact, to, 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 to skilled wage ratios, it's important, um, an important trade fact. You can see again that the um, this this volatile line is what the gravity model says, and is is kind of way off the trend. The other line is what the traditional trade model says, in which trade is determined by 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 comparative advantage. And you can see that's much generally closer to to what actually happened in the UK economy. So that really sums up why we don't think. The, the gravity model that is tending to be used by the profession and by the treasury in particular to analyze how Brexit will affect the economy. It's not the correct model. It's, it just doesn't do justice to, to UK facts. And if you just look at this slide here with what those facts are, you see, what, what the classical model says is there's a competition in world markets and that the UK a supplier, which is a small one, can sell anywhere at world prices. Freight costs are quite low, of course, zero on, on, on services. And so what happens is trade is dominated by comparative advantage. And in our case, that, that's because we've got a large supplies of skilled labor. And you can see that in the city where we have a strong comparative advantage. Of course, the gravity model says kind of the opposite. It says competition's really weak, products are all different, and everyone's got a niche and you can sell once you've got your niche, very hard to dislodge you. And you sell most in these close markets uh, where you've got your strongest niche. That's the EU. And it's really hard to break into distant non-EU markets. And then they kind of cap it all by saying, because trade is dominated by these niche geographical elements, then technology follows trade so that, you know, Everything is driven by demand here, really, and even technology. Of course, this is absolute nonsense. And, you know, as if you think about UK trade uh, and, 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 and what, what the, the last point on this slide here, if, what, what, the UK's trade is not like gravity at all. The, 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 the UK, the city, is the world's top financial centre and sells sells all around the world. 54% of UK exports go to the non-EU. And FDI, which is supposedly driven, dominated by the EU, comes from everywhere. So if you, the casual knowledge, casual inspection of UK trade facts would tell you the model that the profession is using on this is completely wrong for the UK. It might, it might fit other countries. We, we need to check that out. And that's something we're looking at, but it certainly doesn't fit the UK. So that's, that's really Brexit where I think common sense says we'll have a deal, we will do free trade deals, and we'll have a deal with the EU that basically leaves things as they are. Now, turning to the, to the virus, you know, there are, there are some facts. I mean, virologists and scientists say all sorts of things every day about how little they know and what might happen, but there are quite a lot of facts which we can look at of how the virus has actually progressed and actually, how it's progressed is according to a logistic curve, which applies to all epidemics. The logistic curve has a sort of a shape where, you know, you get a foothold if you're, if you're a new arrival, uh, and then you spread quite rapidly as the infection rates low and people get easily infected. And then you meet saturation and the whole thing slows down. And um, what we find when we look at these facts, here are the facts that you can see across the world. The logistic curve, this is a log scale, so it, it shows the progress of the logistics curve on a, on a, on a log scale, which isn't an S-shaped curve, it's more like a, a C, a downward facing C, as you can see there, where initially it grows pretty fast. The, the slope of the line is the change in the log, which is the proportional rate of growth, and then it flattens off later on, as you can see. And that's a whole bunch of countries. And you apply this model to the UK and you look at the things behind it. I'll just um, go back here to, to the things. The things behind it are really that 
you've got governments doing lockdown, you've got social reaction by ordinary people to the threat of the virus, which, which is pretty effective action. You know, they wear masks and they, they avoid each other and so on and so forth um, under social guidance. And we've got quite an interesting comparator here with Sweden, which had social guidance and no lockdown. And what we find is that Sweden actually had just about the same result on the virus as we did with, with social guidance, which of course is much less expensive than lockdown, which caused quite bad recession. So here's a picture of, of the progress of Sweden and the progress of the UK. These are the, the death rates in, in both countries, the, the shape of, of, of the spread of, of deaths. And you can see that there's really very little in the, in, the, in the shape of the development of the disease in the two countries, even though Sweden didn't have a lockdown and we did. And so the moral of this story really is that you're better off with social guidance. It's less expensive to the economy. Um, and here are our forecasts based on our modeling and the logistic curves of of where deaths are going. On the left-hand side, you've got the UK. Uh, this is falling off quite sharply now. On the right-hand side, you've got the global situation in the 25 worst affected countries, where you can see again that uh, after the, the recent uptick, which is largely related to US states in the South, which we kind of know about, there's, there's quite a steady fall uh, projected from, from the sort of the way in which the uh, the, the cases are developing around the world. So um, what sort of recovery come, comes out of this modeling of the virus? I think the, the thing that a lot of economists have not emphasized enough is that this is a very unusual recession because it's actually been caused by the government. You know, I mean, normally recessions are caused by things that the government doesn't have anything to do with and is very unhappy about. Whereas in this case, the government actually caused the recession. So in, in a way, you can, you know, you can argue perfectly reasonably, I think, that what the government has caused, it can jolly well uncause. And that's, that's I think, been missing from a lot of the analysis. Um, and if you, go, if you go down that logic, um, what you can see is that if the projections of the virus's retreat are correct, then lockdown will be reversed and social reaction will be get weaker as people see things are coming under control and then there'll be a recovery that will indeed be v-shaped um if, if we look at the latest indicators and you can see that in these retail sales figures which are slightly out of date of course now and stock markets that stock markets have kind of revived as we know having seen that there is recovery going on and it is quite V-shaped. Um, retail sales that you've got here, they're, they're the May figures, so they're still showing quite a drop from a year ago. And industrial production, which is again uh, May figures, are, are showing a huge impact of the, of the virus. And GDP, which is first quarter, is down, but not as much as we know it, it dropped later on and unemployment is not yet beginning to show much effect because of furloughing going on pretty much everywhere. Um, and so what about the very latest indicators? Well they're showing quite a bounce back. You know you've got manufacturing, purchasing managers index bouncing back in the UK to about 50 for manufacturing and services 47 from, the, from pretty dire figures earlier in the year and Retail sales, which I think quite interesting, British Retail Consortium, the latest figures show full recovery from a year ago. In fact, three and a half percent up. So that's quite good news, I think. It shows that retail sales now have really picked right back up to where they were. And the same sort of pattern is showing up in US retail sales, where there's a big bounce back um, uh, in, in the f figures from, um, uh, in, in, in May, bouncing back after the bad, the very bad April figures. Um, so quite a bounce back really in the, uh, in those retail sales. And um, I don't know, I seem to have come to a grinding halt here. Ah, here we are. And here's an interesting figure. 
Um, for the global PMI, this is a JP Morgan global PMI patching managers figure, which shows you that the global PMI is now consistent with GDP being back to where it was a year ago, which is again a big bounce back, a big V-shaped bounce back. You can sort of see the V on the right hand side of the diagram in the PMI. Um, and the, 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 the equivalent scale here shows you the calculated GDP year on year growth that that's consistent with. And you can see we're back at the zero point, which is, which is full recovery. So I think generally speaking, um, here's another chart which shows how this should develop given in, in the improving containment of the virus, which I kind of showed on the previous chart. So I think we're looking, and here's the, the latest PMIs, uh, purchasing managers indices by countries led by China, as you can see there, but growth, growth reappearing in France and the other countries still a bit below the 50 mark, but we would expect in the July PMIs to see the, them, them getting out of the woods as well. So I think this leads to an overall GDP forecast across the world of a, of a drop this year of around the 6% mark for most developed countries, and then a bounce back next year of a similar magnitude. Um, now turning last of all, and trying to be brief on the, on the public finances and the virus, what we've seen from sovereign debt issue and the capacity of a sovereign money printing central bank is that, you know, there is a big capacity for the public finances to deal with a crisis. Of course, we knew this anyway from, from our experience with two world wars, uh, where, where public debt went soaring up um, and then was dealt with later. The present situation, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has been incredibly lucky, really, with, with his timing of this crisis because interest rates around the world are close to zero. And uh, the, the debt he's, he's issued, if it gets into the marketplace, will we'll find interest rates running at the 0.1 to 0.4% range on, on, on extremely long maturities. And um, this is, of course, the zero hour bound on the World Savings Club that was, was, in, was in place before, before the COVID crisis. And so the Treasury has been able to issue this debt at very low interest rates. And uh, what this means is that the, the, the borrowing that Rishi Sunak's had to do, about 300 billion so far, um, which has been matched by quantitative easing purchases by the Bank of England. The situation is so far the government's lent to itself, which, isn't, which, which is really not a desirable situation because it hasn't got it off the public sector balance sheet. I mean, the Bank of England is owned by the government. So, this is not a great situation for the government. So it's important really that the Bank of England should get this debt into the private markets in these, at these low interest rates. And the treasury should be selling its debt to, to, to the markets, which the bank is now buying, at as long maturities as possible, because that way it keeps the burden. Ideally, it should be doing it at perpetuities. Perpetuities mean that you, you, you simply pay yourself, you, you pay out interest and you don't repay the debt. And if you can, if the, as it should be able to, the treasury gets this debt off and the bank gets it off in turn into the markets at these very low interest rates, then we're looking at an interest payment, a, a kind of ongoing interest payment of the order of 0.1 to 0.4% on this 300 billion or so, which is actually peanuts. It, Im it involves something like a 0.2 pence in the pound rise in the, in, in the standard rate to pay it off. And it, it really is because of this fortunate timing uh, from the Chancellor's viewpoint, these, these crisis debts won't cost the taxpayer very much at all. But what needs to happen now, in my opinion, is that, that uh, the money supply that's been printed has to be reversed in order to see off the inflation threat. I mean, money supply growth is now running at 10% plus in the UK. 
and much higher rates in the US. And that kind of illustrates the inflationary danger of these policies. And what we need to do now is for the, the government to issue as much debt and the bank to issue as much debt into the market to these very low rates so that the taxpayer cost is kept right down. But then the bank needs to get, get rid of the money, uh, the, 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 the debt it's, it's got on its balance sheet as part of this process so that it gets into the market to these rates. But another benefit of doing that will be that the bank will be getting the money supply back under control and allowing interest rates to rise. And so we get away from the zero lower bound. So I see the way the policy developing as fiscal policy remains quite expansionary, pushing up interest rates, pushing debt into the markets, and the bank tightening money and uh, getting rid of the debt it holds so that money gets tightened and, and rates start to rise and we get away from the pre-COVID situation of the zero low bound with monetary policy basically powerless. So that's the way I see it. And as part of this expansionary fiscal policy, which I think must continue to keep the pressure on upward pressure on interest rates and to keep support to the economy, I see that that Rishi Sunak should be quite aggressive in fiscal policy, looking for growth producing tax cuts. I mean, there's a lot of taxes that can be cut. And I reckon that fiscal policy can be quite expansionary to the extent of about 5% of GDP for quite a long time. That's about 100 billion a year. And use that to support the economy by cutting corporation tax, get rid of these top rates, um, and also cut the standard rate a bit and do some infrastructure spending. All this, I think, is now not only feasible fiscally, but also desirable in order to support growth, um, both through the supply side and through the demand side. And that, I think, is, is now Rishi Sunak's job looking forward. And I'm quite optimistic with the V-shaped recovery and Rishi Sunak um, continuing to provide fiscal support we can keep the unemployment rate down and also put a big load of momentum behind supply side restructuring on the UK economy. Patrick, Patrick, Thanks very much. Patrick, Patrick thank you very much indeed. And that enables us to segue very nicely into Bridget. Uh, you mentioned infrastructure and spend and uh, perhaps Bridget, you'd like to address those and any other issues you want to in the next segment. But Patrick, thank you very much. Bridget. Thanks very much. I certainly can't respond to everything that, that Patrick has said in, in, in a five minute uh, segment, but I'll do my best. And as you say, start on uh, where he finished, which is really around structural change. Because I don't think that there's any doubt now that what's happening out there, and I'm seeing it in the businesses that I'm involved with, is we've got an acceleration of trends which were already there. Whether that's about changing working practices, we've all been used to working at home and I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing, but there's certainly some embedded change of habit there. Whether it's about accelerating other forms of technical change like use of cash, the way that retail sales works uh, into a um, major owner of uh, retail malls has already gone into receivership. So all of these sort of trends which were already there are now being accelerated. So there will be faster structural change, I think, over the next five years than there might otherwise have been where it would have been mitigated by, if you like, business as usual. So um, I don't know what the new normal is because all of that will depend upon the individual decisions of firms and consumers. All I do know is that we need to facilitate that if we are to be successful and if we're able to be successfully um, react to the opportunities which are going to be generated by Brexit. And, and I suppose it's the first time I think I've sat on a panel where all of the economists have been in favour of Brexit and not against it. Although everybody says all economists are against Brexit. Well, I'm not. Um, the Moving on from that, therefore, is how is not just how we facilitate structural change in the sense of those macro things of retail sales and so on, 
but also how we do that in the context of, of a leveling up agenda, because I actually think that's very important. We've got to get away from the idea that this is um, only about London. I was chief economist for London, gregeri has been a chief economist for London, but there, we both recognise there are other places in the country as well, and that's really important. And that's where the infrastructure part of this story, particularly on the transport part of the infrastructure at any rate, can be, um, can be made to, to really, I think, pay some dividends because infrastructure isn't actually, doesn't directly create growth. Infrastructure is a necessary component, but certainly not a sufficient one. But, and it is part of the government's job to produce the right kind of policy framework and infrastructure framework, which enables people to feel confident about investing, whether they're coming in from abroad or whether indeed they're domestic investors taking advantage of low rents, uh, skills, wages, whatever to create the jobs. Government doesn't create jobs. Firms, consumers, people, they create jobs. Um, so I also think that part of this story needs to be about continued devolution. The, uh, we remain one of the most centralized economies in the, in the, in certainly in the developed world. Um, and the man from Whitehall really doesn't know best. So again, that's part of liberating entrepreneurialism, if you like, actually also includes liberating entrepreneurialism in local uh, authorities. Some of them will get it wrong. There will be mistakes made, but that's what happens under a more entrepreneurial um, framework. So it's up to government to produce the, that, to show that their confidence is uh, creating a framework in which people will also then feel confident to invest, create businesses and accelerate that structural change, which will create new trading patterns and new trading frameworks. The thing is that, well, so what, what are the risks to that? Uh, Patrick's giving us a very optimistic um, picture uh, and, and yeah, I agree that that is one possible uh, outcome. Um, On the other hand, I'm chairman of a bank, so I keep having to do stress testing and look at the downsides and, and all of that aspect to it. I just come from a meeting with the PRA, so I think that there are still, there are some, there's some potential to get this wrong. Um, and what what might those be? So I think uh, one is I think negative rates and low rates. Fine, they uh, you know as, as as Patrick's pointed out, it makes it possible to run these kind of deficits without too much implication for quite a period. But if we run back into negative rates, then there's a whole lot of system problems and um, you know challenging attitudes and and so on that we're really really I think going to have to we, we, people would struggle with and it would undermine confidence. I think that's one risk. There's clearly, there's, I think there's a risk on um, centralization. All new governments keep wanting to pull everything back into number 10, into Whitehall and even worse into number 10. And we're seeing that at the moment. I think that's a problem. There are some very good people in number 10, but there are good people all over the country and it cannot be the case that uh, only a small group of people are able to make the right decisions. And finally, I think that there's um, the, the upside of, one of the upsides of writing our own regulations is we can go back into a more common law basis uh, situation, which is where we came from, and that the European regulatory system has definitely worked against, and there are loads of lawyers outside there who would agree. On the other hand, I think we've become a much more legalistic system. We see, we see a Supreme Courts and so on overriding political um, positions, overriding national policy statements in the case of Heathrow, for example. And so I think there's a risk that we all have to try and think how to manage of allowing the lawyers to rewrite a whole lot of even more complex regulation compared to where we were. I've just been sitting on a, on a task force, hopefully trying to help reform planning uh, legislation so I think there's some real, there are some definitely bright spots, um, but there are equally some potential downsides and financing public transport is definitely going to be one of them. Uh, I think that's, that's enough for me. I'll certainly come back in, in questions, but I think I'll stop there and hand over, hand over to Jerry. Bridget, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And so you see um, HS2 going ahead as, as we're told, you see Crossrail continuing and some of these other major projects as important things for the future? Uh, ma managing the right kind of major projects is definitely the right thing to do. Uh, the National Infrastructure Commission, where I sit, we're doing a piece of work um, sponsored by the Treasury, 
on the rail needs for the north and the midlands so that's hs2 but it's also about how it fits into the uh, the broader um the, the the broader connectivity requirements and indeed capacity requirements that everybody has got um and crossrail it uh, when i did originally the case for crossrail i under the benefits because i didn't think anybody would believe them if i put in what i really think so it can overrun on cost quite substantially and it's still utterly worth doing anyway thank it's you really good Bridget, thank you very much indeed. And, and Jerry, last but by no means least, um, if you'd like to reflect on what's been said and uh, add your views, that, thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Uh, first, it's a great pleasure to be asked to speak to the Asia Scotland Institute. Last few times I've actually been able to do it in person in Edinburgh and Glasgow, but albeit remotely, it's great to be able to speak to you. And naturally, it's a great honour, great pleasure to be able to share the panel with Bridget and Patrick. I would echo, indeed, agree with most of what they've said. Let me focus on three areas, domestic, global, and then the bilateral relationship between the UK and China. On the domestic side, I'll be very brief because uh, Patrick and Bridget have covered this very well, but I just wanted to highlight some things. I very much reinforced the point that unlocking will allow the economy to recover. Unfortunately, however, because we are in a vaccine gap, not all sectors will be able to return to normal quickly, but the recovery will allow the economy to get back to its pre-crisis level probably by before the end of next year. And also, while unemployment will be hit by the end of furloughing, by the vaccine gap, and also by the overhang of debt, unemployment should start to be on the downward trajectory after the end of this year. But the, there will be some scarring as a result of this crisis, but overall, I think one should be positive about the UK economic outlook. I echo what Bridget and Patrick have said about Brexit. I think it's positive. We should embrace it, notwithstanding potential near-term challenges. But the one thing I would really want to stress on the UK side is I still think we need a clear economic vision articulated from Whitehall and Downing Street. I would call it the three arrows, and I would like the government, the Chancellor, the Prime Minister to aim for a bullseye on each. And the three arrows are monetary and financial policy, as Patrick has touched on. It's fiscal policy. And there, I think it's vital that the economic orthodoxy, if I can call it that, is pushed back. We do not need tax increases. We do not need to actually view the increase in debt as a problem. The challenge in my mind is that in good times, we don't push rates high enough, and in good times, we don't run budget surpluses. But in difficult times, as now, with low inflation, low rates, and low yields, there is the scope, as Patrick has highlighted, to borrow. And I would echo, as he has touched on, the ability and indeed the need to reduce taxes in the future. So there is the big battleground in terms of the domestic debate. And the third arrow is the whole supply side. And Bridget has touched on infrastructure and planning. There are other aspects of this, but it is about really incentivizing the private sector. So when you pull all those together, monetary financial policy, fiscal policy, and the supply side, we do need the pro growth strategy. The second arrow is the global picture. As a result of this crisis, people keep talking about what will change. I must admit, when I was at the centre, so to speak, of the SARS epidemic in terms of covering that as head of research at Standard Chartered in 2003. Then in Hong Kong and Northeast Asia, there were widespread predictions of phenomenal fundamental change. And some things did change, but 18 months later, most people, most businesses had got back to normal. What did change was better planning for the future, not just amongst businesses, but governments. I think many things will return to normal. But globally, two things that were evident before the crisis will dominate in the future. One is the fourth industrial revolution, innovation, inf basically investment is needed in the whole sort of, sort of technological side. That will really dominate. As two will be the shift in the balance of power to the Indo-Pacific, from India in the West to America in the East. Britain and the West of Europe needs to reposition themselves in this changing global dynamic. But some things will change as a result of this crisis. 
I would summarize that or those as the three G's, grassroots, green and geopolitics. Grassroots, we're seeing it, some things being brought back home on shoring, wages starting to creep up in the public sector, more of a domestic agenda. There will be other facets to that. The green agenda will become more central. You could argue the UK with its commitment to net zero was already ahead of the curve on that. And next year in Glasgow, we have the next COP meeting. Near term though, it's probably the other G, the geopolitical environment that will become very important. After the global financial crisis, we saw a movement from G7 to G20. That was over a decade ago. Now I would say it's very much a G2 world, America and China. Trade tensions came to the fore in recent years. This year, very difficult to read things because in every US presidential election year in the last couple of decades, China has been a big political card. It's all seemed very poor in terms of that relationship, but only for the politics to change once whoever wins the election is in the White House. So difficult to overplay or underplay the China-US card in the US election year. But the point is that once we move into next year, I do think geopolitical tensions in both South and East China Sea, in terms of the Belt Road Initiative, and more widely in terms of the battle for economic supremacy will come more to the fore. So there will be things that do change and things that do not change. But the third and final area is the UK-China relationship. I know China is only one part of the Asia story, but for the Scotland Asia Institute, there are great opportunities from India to Southeast Asia, but China probably attracts attention very much at the moment. Here I would stress there is a need in my mind for the UK government to differentiate between strategic and non-strategic areas. I think that will be the direction we go down. Strategic being defense, security, intelligence, and as a result of that, telecommunications, hence the decision or reverse decision on Huawei. The opportunity for businesses is that once those so-called red lines are drawn, obviously we cannot ignore human rights, we cannot ignore the rule of law, they need to be vital in any relationship. But for businesses, we need to almost let the government focus on setting the parameters there, while we in the business economic world need to focus on where the opportunities really do lie in business, trade and economic terms. And in economic terms, it's very important to stress that in, shall we say, the last phase of China development in the last 20 years, where made in China has been the three words that have dominated, Germany has been the European country that has really played a big role. In the next stage of China's development, where we go from made in China to maybe bought by China, and also to paid in renminbi, it's the moving up of the value curve. It's the emergence of a service sector economy. And there Britain, along with America, leads in the world. And therefore Britain is important in terms of China's next stage of development. And the other aspect of our bilateral relationship with China is in third countries. Britain's global financial expertise, whether it's in Edinburgh or in London, allows the UK to play an important role in the Belt Road Initiative Bridget mentioned common law. It's also other aspects of our financial expertise. But overall, putting it together on the domestic agenda, I think we should be positive, but we do need, I think, clarity about our economic vision. Globally, some things will not change. The fourth industrial revolution, the emergence of Indo-Pacific, some things will change. Grassroots, green, and geopolitical tensions. But the third area I looked at, the UK-China relationship, notwithstanding some issues at the moment, once we get clarity over the strategic versus non-strategic area, I think there's a lot of opportunity for the UK-China relationship in economic, financial and trade terms to grow. Thank you. Gary, thank you very much for those comments. Extremely interesting. I've got a, a question for you, which we could perhaps broaden to the, the panel and then see if we have some questions from the other uh, our followers. People have been buying things, obviously, on the internet. I mean, the growth of Amazon and others is extraordinary. I mean, I've been doing that. My family's been doing that. You probably have. Yet, in Scotland, certainly, uh, we are miles behind in terms of the development of e-commerce. 
And whilst there are, I think, a hundred free ports in China at the moment, there are relatively few in the United Kingdom. And these free ports, particularly linked to e-commerce, are a fantastic source of revenue and, of course, generate considerable trade flows. When you talk about the, the fourth industrial revolution, if you like, this is this a part of is this a plank in in that virtual infrastructure that needs to be created and is the government slow in moving forward with it um well I'll, as you directed at me yes uh, in the wider spread debate about free ports often the media picks up the idea of physical free ports but i think you asked the question very relevantly virtual free ports are key now the physical free port coastal areas the differentiation between coastal taxes, customs sort of taxes stop and yeah. at the start. Uh, free ports in the fiscal sense allow the government to work with local areas to revitalize parts of the UK economy. The imbalances in the UK economy include coastal versus inland as well as urban versus rural. And the 2017 reports from the government about hot spots and cold spots, many of those 65 cold spots they identified then were in coastal areas so there is a physical aspect to free ports but i think you're right the government can move forward and i think the chancellor definitely is working along this is the virtual free ports and it's about the idea despite the current economic rhetoric the aim is to reduce regulation to ease taxes in those areas to begin with and the virtual free ports don't have to be physically based on the coast and that offers opportunities for Scotland and indeed other parts of the UK as well. Thank you. Bridget, this, since this was a sort of infrastructure type question as well, do you have any comments on e-commerce and free ports? Uh, several. So, so on the free port side of things, I, I agree with, with Jerry that it have to be just physical ports, although actually that would help in some places. Um, and there has been some consultation about free ports, but it has to wait until we've left the EU because it's not, because it's, otherwise it's state aid and, and, and we're stuck on it. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, creating bandwidth that enables everybody to engage in, um, in e-commerce uh, is really also very important. If you can't get online, you can't actually do any of this. So the policies around supporting rollout of 5G and um high bandwidth um wi-fi is really important and that certainly there are policies for england and wales which are, are the responsibility of the for infrastructure commission that we've been pushing out and i think that's that's a no-brainer investment if you like i can't imagine scenarios in which case in which that's not worth doing um but the other part of it is how you think about freight because although virtual business is going to be important moving goods around and the onshoring part of this and having an effective freight industry tends to be um, a bit invisible so things like where depots should be for last mile deliveries uh, the sites for those tend to compete certainly in london in some other city centers with residential development so some policy aspects of that uh, and I think we need to pay more attention to how the freight system works. The freight, the people who do freight are incredibly efficient within the policy constraints that they are operating in. Mm. But there's, there's so far, and I'm trying to change this, not been enough attention given to some of those last mile delivery issues, location of, um, of the big boxes, if you like, the, the big warehouses, and quite difficult to get planning permission for those. Um, and we need to make sure that's done better. Thank you, Bridget. Patrick, on that subject or anything else that occurs to you before we go out to the, the wider world, do you have any comments to make? On the kind of whole business of levelling up, I'd like to emphasise that, you know, the North is not a sort of separate economy um, and it can benefit very much from tax cuts. So I think, you know, we shouldn't see levelling up as anything other than a good supply side policy and i would expect tax cuts to have particular effect in the north because there are more resources in the north and the elasticity of supplies are are, are greater simply because you know they are relatively less congested than the south where uh, there's, there's obviously tremendous pressure on resources land and people so 
I would like to see a unity in this fiscal strategy that I'm glad Jerry also supports. So, you know, strong supply side, supply side fiscal um, fiscal policy uh, that goes for growth. And I don't see any contradiction between that and um, the leveling up agenda because of this whole point that most of the benefits of supply side, uh, you know, improvement will accrue in the North where resources are present. Thanks very much. Uh, Doug, Doug Cook, could you uh, like to ask some questions now and lead us forward? I, I'd love to ask a question, if I may, please, Roddy. Um, sorry, I'll just turn my video on. That's um, right. I, really, I think maybe for, well, perhaps for all the panel, but Patrick in particular, um, I was encouraged by the idea that you were suggesting that we should um, encourage this supply side fiscal policy. But uh, I'm, I'm clearly we need to um, sell off the debt that you were talking to through the markets. And I just wondered whether with interest rates as low as they are, I mean, is, is that something that's sufficiently attractive to people to buy? Well, uh, this, am I audible? You yes. are. Yes, that, that's the thing. The world, world interest rates are very low um, and it's not just the UK. We've had this, we've had this um, savings glut and the zero low bound for a long time now. And that means that the market rates are indeed at this level, which means that they can be sold at these rates. I think if you suddenly try and sell 300 billion in the market at per, at per, at perpetuities, you'll have a problem. But the bank is in the situation of having acquired a lot of very long-term debt from the treasury. And it can, it can gradually sell it off into the market at these rates. And I think this, these low rates are likely to persist in the market simply because of inter the international situation. Um, and, and the fact that recovery has not yet occurred. Until that has occurred, the markets will continue to absorb this debt. Essentially, you know, you, you say, well, why would anyone want to buy it? Well, just look at the markets. People are, people, you can't, they can't get enough of this stuff because the government is safe. You know, they think, well, at least I'll get my, I'll get some money out of this. I'll get a coupon and I may not get a coupon from anything else. And so, of course, this is why these rates in the present situation in the market are, are so low and why the debt can be sold. So that's just market facts, really, uh, you know, Doug. And um, the, the problem has been that the treasury seems to have got a fit of the nerves basically it can't believe it's luck and so encouraged by the obr which has always been a sort of kind of hopeless organization in my view a uh, very very backward looking and uh, you know negative in its approach deliberately so because george osborne created it essentially to back it to back him up on austerity now we're moving into a, 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 a I think we've lost uh, Patrick, but uh, thank you, Patrick. I think we, we, we uh, understood your answer As there. a new leader. Oh, Patrick, sorry, we lost you very briefly there. Um, but I have another question from Ed Craig, if you'd like to ask your question. I didn't think this is for everybody in the panel. Well, my question is actually more to do with the fact that the UK and Scotland has committed towards net zero carbon uh, by 2040, 2045. And my, my question is, do you believe that both a clean hard Brexit as well as potentially the application of the measures you've been suggesting, I won't go through them, will actually help or hinder our approach towards a, a net zero carbon economy and society? Well, you know, I mean, net zero carbon has to be done in a way that doesn't destroy the economy and I'm assuming that that will be the way it is done. Um, and in that case, it'll be part of what Bridge has been talked about. It's this, these changes in the structure of the economy that are going on, you know, include, include the movement uh, towards more, um, more wind and, uh, wind and um, sun, you know, generated um, power and electric cars and all that sort of thing. So 
these are all the structural changes that I think Bridget rightly emphasized. So I, I, I'm seeing it much more from a macro point of view. The thing that bothers me is that there'll be a sudden retreat by the treasury led by the forces of darkness, essentially, as I see them, <laughs> that will suddenly want to put up taxes, you know? I mean, the usual suspects will, will urge this agenda. We'll get it from the OBR, we'll get it from the Institute of Fiscal Studies. We have an establishment that is basically opposed Brexit and is kind of still, I think, infected with the anti-Brexit bug. And that's what worries me most, that these people will, will gain the upper hand perhaps supported by old treasury lags into a, a very negative fiscal agenda. That's the biggest worry to me. And, and I want to see a very positive fiscal agenda that supports the structural changes that are going to occur. Patrick, thank you. Thank about. you. Patrick, thank you very much indeed. We, we lost you briefly there. Perhaps briefly, uh, Bridget and, and then Jer uh, Jerry, if you could comment on that last question and then I'll pass back to Roddy. Thank you. Okay, so on zero carbon, I think that um, actually there's a, there's, the UK is doing actually pretty well on the energy side of things. We're getting some great results off wind. I think you're not too bad on solar, actually, considering uh, the kind of uh, climate that we've got. The really interesting challenge, however, will be things like heat, decarbonisation, uh, and doing some work around that at the moment. And, um, and the technologies for vehicles where we are not the designers of those. HGVs, for example, are moving them over to, say, hydrogen, which is entirely possible. That's not, under, that's not a UK thing. We will have to live with whatever Siemens and, and so on actually come up with. So getting involved in, in those technologies is going to be quite important. Um, and I think just finally, just coming back to um, you know, old lags in the Treasury, uh, I think that is a risk, not just on fiscal policy, but because too many of them have been trained in a neoclassical economics where everything is always for the best in the best of all possible worlds and nothing makes a difference. And there are people in there who will tell you that if the world's not like that, it's the world that's wrong, not their description of it. So I think we've still got a real problem in how Treasury operates, whether it's fiscal or monetary attitude uh, or infrastructure. And that's something that... Um, we need to continue to fight. Thanks, yeah. Bridget. Um, Jerry. Yeah, Ed's question. Um, yeah, I'm quite constructive post Brexit about many aspects of the UK outlook, but the environment is one of those. And um, more generally, uh, not Brexit related, is that I think we've moved in the last few years, maybe the last few decades, away from viewing the environmental agenda as being anti growth to now seeing the environmental agenda as intertwined with growth. And that's partly reflecting changing consumer behavior. I think part of the challenge is always when we try and impose things from the top down, uh, the, the government knows best, so to speak, as Bridget touched on earlier. But I think um, outside of the EU, I think we should reinforce an important message that within the EU, the UK in areas such as workers' rights and in areas such as the environment, I thought was always on the side of pushing the agenda. Um, so I think we have the ability, subject to what the British people want and how people and companies behave, to uh, see the growth agenda and the green agenda sort of more intertwined. Of course, within that, there are opportunities. They've been touched on. Hydrogen hasn't been mentioned. Electric vehicles has. But I think. Uh, it's important not to over-regulate. And again, it's coming back to this battle as to who knows best. And I fear that as a result of this crisis, and the New Statesman had an interesting piece about this four, five, six weeks ago, actually, how they saw as a shift to the left. And I think that interventionist approach from Downing Street has made sense in some areas, but one needs to make sure that interventionist approach might only be temporary, because of the crisis or doesn't actually uh, go too far into different parts of the economy and I really do echo what Bridget and Patrick have said about um, the fiscal agenda and the economic orthodoxy. Um, economics as a profession probably should be more humble um, given how many things economists 
thankfully not those on this panel have seemed to get wrong, but um, this idea that if it's not working, it's because the world needs to change, as Bridget touched on, is key. I, and I do think that one of the big debates in the next few years is on the fiscal side. And I think that um, the question that Doug touched on earlier, debt to GDP after the Second World War was 248%, obviously, because we had a war. Uh, debt to GDP now is 99.6%, set to go above 100%. If we have a pro-growth agenda, and we have low inflation, low rates, and low yields, then we can bring that debt to GDP down steadily without having to embark upon higher taxes. But also as part of that pro-growth agenda, tax cuts are necessary and are part of the overall policy agenda. One flip side of this though is so-called financial repression. Um, low rates are part and parcel of this environment. Thank you. Jerry, thank you very much indeed. And, and I'd like now, because the, the magical hour is up, to, to thank uh, all our panellists. Um, I'm sort of reminded of the RAF motto, I think, per audio ad astra, uh, because you're all pretty optimistic that we're going to reach the stars in due course one way or another, faux de rien. And um, it's, it's very interesting to hear the things that you've highlighted. We, we've got some events coming up which will be interesting and relevant. We we're going to be hearing from Alan Jope before too long, the new newish chief executive of Unilever. We'll be hearing from the new uh, chief executive of Aberdeen Standard. Uh, we have an interesting session coming up with the vice chancellor of Edinburgh University talking about the huge threats and difficulties that uh, the university sector is facing and I would have loved to have asked you what happens if three million energetic entrepreneurial Hong Kongers come and settle. Do we have Hong Kong in the Highlands again, which is what of course was discussed and encouraged, or somewhere in the north, um, to, to, to continue to energize our, um, our economy. I think it's rather a nice idea. But, but thank you, all three of you, for um, participating. It's great to have the three of you together. And uh, also to those who've been following us, Ed, thank you for your question too, from the Edinburgh Centre for Carbon Innovation, another example of terrific innovation um, in, in Scotland. And until we meet again, as, as not as the witches said in Macbeth, but I have to mention Macbeth since I'm in Scotland. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks. <laughs>